Kathy Vick, Deeply Awake. Uh, what I'm going to present to you is sort of like a culmination of a lifetime, actually. And I'm going to uh, entitle it Enemy Mine. And uh, this is the bookend to the first essay that I wrote as Deeply Awake on March 23 of 2012, nine years after a very significant event. And it's labeled Judas Energy. Um, I worry sometimes, or thought, I've wondered sometimes, not worried, I've wondered sometimes why it is that I have such a, a blunt edge sometimes with my reportage. Uh, why do I couch things in metaphor? Why do I see things as a paradox and then express them as essays? Why? Yeah, well, there's so many things I've called myself over the years, but uh, there are a few epithets that are true, and they're just titles, really. I'm a poet. I'm a philosopher. I'm a writer. I'm a reporter. I'm a spiritual journalist, I guess. But I write in uh, in ways that are more like prose poems than um, discussion of facts and breaking down of probabilities. They did more of that after 2016. But, I mean, I have a flavor that is uh, poetic. Okay. All right. Well, um, you know, it, it makes sense. The very, very first sort of Akashic thing I did was to um, get real quiet and state to every, everything in my fields, every, all of it, all creation, please step, I was gonna do a, a novel, I didn't know how to write a novel. I wanted to create something and I didn't know how. But the, but the need and the will was so strong. I sat down and said, I know that you walk with me. I just do. And I need for those who are willing and of the highest, the pinnacle of their skill, of their insight, those who really, truly, not only understand, but can express in ways that make the heart flutter and the mind real and the soul will come into focus. Please step forward and join me. Please come and be with me in my mind, in my heart, in my awareness. Express through me. I'll know. I'll know. And I'll let you teach me. I have done my energetic management, okay? And so I, I, uh, I understand it's quite possible to be um, labeled in this um, new age environment as being tricked or being uh, or listening to uh, trickery and thinking that it's true. Well, I think that's what we're all talking about as channelers and writers. My, one of my missions was to talk about discernment. How do you become someone who can have spiritual discernment? Cryon also talks about spiritual discernment. And I haven't met or heard anyone in this community who hasn't been able to describe that they just, they know when it's pure. It just makes sense. And there's some stuff that just doesn't feel good. And 
that's just a perfectly fine way of expressing it. But if you are sensitive and you can feel your energy and you can feel it bend and twist and you can feel resistance, um, what you come to find is that there's not a whole lot of literature in the mainstream that even acknowledges that. <laughs> Although some do, some do, and fairy tales, of course. And that's why I like literature and art, because it acknowledges that there's something going on here that has to do with the human heart, that has to do with the finest qualities that we know heal and uh, that create rather than destroy. So, and then, you know, of course, you know, whales are, are poets, they're philosophers, they are singers, they are guardians. And I really resonate with those dudes. So I think it's okay. Uh, but there comes a time when uh, you just got to lay the, the facts out. And um, mine was a journey of discovery, of discernment, and of a reverse autobiography. You get hit with a with a light, with a, a new way of being, a new way of understanding. Something happens, and you're bigger than you were. And then you have to explain yourself to yourself. You've got to explain reality to yourself all over again. And it doesn't just doesn't just happen once. Once it starts, it doesn't stop. It gets bigger and it gets better. But it gets bigger. And I've talked about this phenomenon as a uh, walking a mountain. There are some things that I can say at the base of the mountain and then when I get midway up the mountain I say those words and they mean something completely different. And I get up to the top and I say those words in full awareness and memory and I realize that I was just babbling down there. But as I walk down the mountain, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And by the end of the mountain, yeah, I can inhabit all three, sure. All three make sense. Which one do I prefer? Which one is most clear? Which one serves me best? And it's the one at the top of the mountain. Where when I can say, um, so be it. And create a reality. Whereas at the base of the mountain, if I say, so be it, I may actually be swearing. See how that works? Uh, it's pretty bizarre. <laughs> when you get to the, the the real big stuff, when you're, you're you know, sort of your whole being pops uh, like a soap bubble, and you realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm just in a bigger soap bubble now. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's kind of um, disorienting. Um, my function has been that of uh, discovering and fostering uh, peace and love. And this is primarily because I didn't see it very much in my reality. But I knew it was there. There's something underlying all of this nonsense. I just know it. And I've, I've gotten such pure, pure avatars of love in my life who healed me because they, they loved me and accepted me as I was. There's no finer medicine and it's where I have um, been unable or unwilling to reciprocate or generate it. Where I feel like I've fallen down and I, I need to address it somehow. I need to make it right. Karma for one, please. How do you break karma? You love everything any way. 
you find a way. And it doesn't matter if it's reciprocated. It doesn't matter if it's understood. It doesn't matter if it's resented. It doesn't matter if it's battered and burned and its ashes are buried. But that's just the structure. The reality remains indelibly a ripple through all time and all space. Anchor enough of that on this earth in humility and in gratitude and in strength and in sovereignty and see how this place changes. That's how it's done. There has been, <clears throat> as I excuse me, as I mentioned in Armageddon, I just talked about it, and I was like driving down the road and just minding my own business, listening to the radio, and it's like I popped in and ho 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 ho, wow. It was intense. It's like the energy was just intense. And I went. Whoosh. Boy, I'm glad I'm down here. <laughs> this is this is perfectly fine. I'll I'll take this. Oh man. It was really super intense the last couple of weeks. And here I was just uh on uh, the learning curve of my life. Like, okay, well, remember when you went to see Boron, Enrique Boron, and he was on the last day you sort of had a thing do you remember? So I'll tell you, it's really cute. The last day of the conference, I was um, I woke up in a in a very peculiar state. <laughs> a very peculiar state, indeed. <laughs> oh my God, I had just been disassembled in this truly and utterly bizarre and beautiful and soft and unbelievably healing week of transformation. It was just like, I woke up and I contacted every single person who I loved, every single one of them. And I didn't even realize what I was doing until it was done. And I looked at the clock and I thought, oh shoot, I don't have much time and I stink. So I had to get in the shower. And when I got in that shower, it was just, I went through every single person, every single person. I brought every single person up and I talked with them because I knew I was completing something. And I was in reverence and thanks in release mode and then I, I got to the last one and I burst into flame in the shower <laughs> it was the most bizarre thing I don't know how to just I don't know how to explain it and uh, I knew that if I took any length of time in the shower I was going to be late but I was told through the morning don't worry about a thing You'll be there before he starts talking. <laughs> I get in the shower and I'm so late. And I'm really, really, I'm, and I'm, then I'm flame. And then I think, oh, shoot. And I look at the clock. I don't know if I looked at the clock again. Maybe I did. And th there was no time. And I got up there, finally. Got dressed and ran up there. And um, he hadn't taken the stage yet. <laughs> I was considerably late. And he always started on time. And uh, I took my seat. I felt I had been disrespectful to coming late, and I felt bad about that. But um, I didn't fully understand what was going on. And um, I had the thought, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I can't do any more slides. It's too hard. It's it's too intense. And I, I need, I need for my grandfather to read me stories from the old country. 
I, I need for all of this to come together in some kind of quantum biologic soup that I understand and can take with me. And I need, I was just like almost crying. I, I, I'm so glad I have my grandfather here to tell me stories from the old country. Please read from the book. Please read from the book. And he began his lecture and the, the projector didn't work. And I was told, um, don't, uh, that it was sort of like a general announcement, just don't worry about it. It's going to work fine after this presentation. It just, just tell stories. And that's what he did. Oh. And he began to tell stories, pulling everything together. And I was gone within about five minutes. I have no conscious memory. I would pop back in, pop back out, but I was gone and he was there in front of me. And uh, he had an Italian accent and he w didn't look like he looks now. And he was so thrilled. I don't know exactly where we went or what we did, but at the end of it, and he's still talking. I mean, I'm, I'm part of me is absorbing everything he's saying, but, um, I'm in my meditative space and um, and he kind of crackles back on in my awareness and says, okay, it's all done. And he's like dancing and so happy. I said, what's done? How, I want to know how that's going to happen because I understand from biological, biological decoding that the whole deal is you got to have this in your conscious awareness. It's getting it that heals you. How am I supposed to be healed? if I haven't gotten anything. And I'm sorry, I gotta do this. <clears throat> and he said, well, look, and he was dancing and he was all excited and he went, well, look. And I looked up and pew, all the way down, all the way down, <laughs> forever, were these huge, huge boxes, they're gift boxes, just dangling there, just dangling there. And he said, look, they're all there. You just have to walk down the road, and you're going to encounter them, and you'll have your answers. You'll have your ahas. You'll have your healings. It's all done. I said, okay, <laughs> all right. And then I was in my body again, and I was listening to the lecture. Um, I had so many bizarre, so just truly and utterly otherworldly experiences during that time. It, it was um, magic. It was truly, truly magic. It was so much fun. It was so fun. It was just amazing. <laughs> oh my God. Utterly amazing. Um, and Dr. Todd was there. And I understand now what he was in resistance to. I understand, I understand why. There was something I hadn't dealt with yet. There was something walking with me that I didn't know about. And um, I spent a lifetime uh, arguing and uh, throwing uh, etheric punches and getting punched. And uh, this thing that was beside me uh, liked to take on forms and, and uh, mess with me, play with me. And the whole idea was a takeaway and hobbling. And it was all purposeful. It was to create this work. So it was an agreement. But, you know, kind of once you see the agreement, you can release it, right? Isn't that the idea? 1911. It's kind of the idea. enemy mind. I didn't talk about it a whole lot. Not at all, really. Very, very rarely. And everything in my environment told me that it was taboo. It was not to even be acknowledged. It was uh, taboo with my friends in, with the light. And it was taboo uh to win. 
at the dark. Enemy mine. It all started when I uh, started watching megalithic docs in between. Oh, I don't know, daily life and exercise and all that stuff and recuperating. And that led me to Egypt. And I'm not, I'm not a big fan of Egypt. Egypt is just like... It's like a wart. I don't like it. Never have. But there's beauty there. There is beauty there. But it's warped and it's ugly and it's mean and it's cold and it's not right. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Maybe you feel the same way. Maybe there are other places that just you go, whoa, whoa, I would never, you couldn't, you couldn't pay me to go there. And everybody else is flocking there or whatever. Okay. Acknowledge it. It's real. Okay. There's a reason. There's a reason. And it's buried in your, in your memory, which is, um, at, in a state of disrepair of one state or another. Okay. Um, but I have been honest about it lately and I want to talk about it now. I, uh, I did the megalith thing and I felt so hugged and warm and happy. And then I did the Egypt thing and I felt all gross and violated. <laughs> and uh, then the speakers came. Then the truth was revealed. And an Armageddon happened up there. Whoa. And maybe it was just for me. That's fine. But I know I'm a big one. So um, I think it's important to talk about resolution. Um, I, th I always thought about Armageddon as sort of like the battle, you know, the life and death struggle. And uh, uh, the apocalypse as the big reveal. Here's the reason you guys were fighting. Here's the outcome. Here's the truth. The revealing of the truth. The burning away of the veil. The big reveal. The big show. And it's pretty stunning for me to have this knowledge and to have it all come together. I'm including an interview by George Cassivallis and, uh, and uh, Carrie from the uh, P Project Camelot. I've only listened to about 20 minutes, but his story is so much, it's very similar. Um, and he, it was just really good to hear another person who have, has survived just the dropping away of everybody that mattered to them and the reordering of your reality every time you have a big, huge experience and you got to somehow, somehow come back and find a way to function <laughs> with people who are not having that experience and who um, need, need to shut you down and shut you up about it because uh, that makes them uncomfortable. <laughs> and one way that to handle that discomfort is, is ridicule. Um, and you know, there are other ways to handle that depending on how heavy handed you are. And um, so the thing is that the enemy's mine and I am the enemy. I really had to struggle with this when I was watching the videos, I finally got to the place where I was listening to contactees. And I listened to Alex Collier. And I don't remember his name. I'll put it in my, my tags. But there's a fellow who, um, there's a video that's 33% reptilian, 33% insectoid, 33% human. And I watched that one, and it blew my mind. I'm a blend. My physical DNA has the genetic imprint of all of those races. That's sort of the point. That's what makes humans so incredibly beautiful, resilient, creative, 
strong, important, and indeed royalty. It is an honor to hold this DNA. It is an honor think about that and then take a look out at um, at Trump land come right back you notice the difference how are you asked to think of yourself in that uh, closed system of government um, medicine justice it's a closed finite system it is an irrelevant system. Closed systems die. And um, listening to that man speak about his experiences, the choice that he made to, uh, to see that these insectoids were, were um, he, he was able to, to, to see benevolently the story behind these races and that's something I couldn't do before they had hurt me I had been hurt by them here and I didn't know how to defend myself they'd come visit and I would feel sick and it was like a ma I would call it a magnetic and it was an illness and I would be sick for a long time and um, that was, I didn't, well, I wasn't visited by spaceships. I wasn't visited by human beings who, who were holding that signature. It smells horrible and is the, is the emotional equivalent and the psychic equivalent of abject raw terror. And they could, they could induce that in me and then feed off of it for weeks and they did that until 2012 it bothered me when I was visited by them again in 2012 I wasn't visited by the entity ever I was visited by his mother who had come for help and I, I don't know if I was um, as compassionate as I could have been but I was in misunderstanding of what was going on. And the, the question had been, should I advise him to, uh, to go ahead and take the uh, monatomic gold he wants to eat? I said, <laughs> I said, no, 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 especially for him, no, no, that would make him miserable, no. And um, I, uh, I had a talk with myself and with my God in the middle of this because I was so threatened. I felt so threatened yet again because there are lesser versions of this in my reality through all of my experiences. It has been everywhere, 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 everywhere. That is what I have come to break. That is what I have come to heal. That is what I have come to love and release. I, I call it the demiurge. That's what I call it. And it has been individuated as has the angelic force. And so you can see it in the Draconians, and you can see it in the Archons, and you can see it in the Jinn. It's the same energy. And that energy runs through the justice system. Let's call it the legal system. And it burps into your wallet as green cash. It invites you. To believe that you must earn everything, including a sense of self-worth, including love, 
including acceptance. It must be earned. Well, that's just a construct. No, it doesn't, you dork. Well-being is my birthright. Joy is my birthright. Fun, play, excitement, creativity, expression, those are my birthrights. Look what my body can do. I can create human life. Can you dare tell me that I'm not free? <laughs> you're dumb. And you're small and you're petty. You're not very bright, you know. Enemy mine. Because I have that inside of me. And I would see it when I would watch a dark film or when someone's doing something dark to another person on film and there'd be like this boom, reverberation in my, and I would feel, and I, <clears throat> it's been weird because for me, it hasn't been a time speed up. I've been really, really happy because everything has slowed the fuck down. <laughs> I can understand things finally. Cause it was like, and, uh, but the last year or so, In the moment, I can see what's going on and respond in a way that is in accord with my what I really know to be true. And not in fear, but, but just in humor. That took things slowing down, not speeding up. Mm -mm. And I like it because I can really think things through. I took all of this super super personally it was right in my face all the time and i don't know maybe it's being a woman but um and maybe it's just being dialed the way i'm dialed I, you know i just let my here's my philosophy of life i'm gonna do what i'm gonna do what i need to do i'm not uh, there are certain things that i uh, you can argue until you're blue in the face i'm still gonna do them you can be upset about it. I don't care. That's fine. Be upset. Enjoy that. But I need to do this. And you having a problem with me completing my mission tells me more about you than me. So I don't care. Have a problem with it. That's a, that's a pretty easy place to be. I don't know how compassionate it is. But that's sort of been my way. And it means that they, everybody else has the same freedom. And that's really, really hard to give. But that's my philosophy. You hang out with people and you let them show you who and what they believe and they are. And within that construct, there are certain things that they're not going to be, they're not going to be able to do. And certain things that they're going to want to do. And it's up to them. Not me. And if I want to join in that, I can. And a lot of it's really fun. But, you know, everybody has the right to choose their own way. But in relationship, it means I watch. I just observe. I let people be. I wasn't like that with my son a whole lot. That was the programming of, you know, I, I've stopped the clamp down. But, um, but yeah, that's how I am with everybody. Just whatever. And I guess it might appear uncaring. <laughs> there, there's a reason for it, though. I, I know of having um, soul urges and experiences that, that can never be explained because they would never be understood. So why bother? And I know that everyone walks around in prisons because they don't talk about their experiences and they don't even have words for their emotions. I was so shut down in 1985 when I started psych nursing that I had to use a an affect chart with faces to realize that there were a lot of expressions of emotionality. I mean, I had just been pooped out of... Um, a pretty rigid structured system and I had a certain amount of um, affective range um, 
but I didn't have words for any of it. And um, I hadn't had mirrors. Um, or I hadn't been paying attention. So um, the repetitive sort of uh, inculcation uh, began to break in nursing school. And then once I got into nursing, I realized I, I really needed to define, I needed to not define myself. That was way premature. I just needed to figure myself out. I just needed to listen to myself. I could finally sit down and listen. And I had some freedom. So that's what I did. I think I started a very multi-dimensional, um, parallel reality. Uh, he was a, div a follower of Lazarus therapist. And, um, that was six years of basically putting myself together. And then I met the teachers who were, um, an insert and they didn't come aboard from a spaceship. They, they, I had to pay money. But that's kind of what my role has been. It's been to um, like walk hand in hand with monsters or what people thought were monsters, oftentimes as a psych nurse. I, I worked with people who went on to murder and, <laughs> and burn things down and rape and, cre and create mayhem. <laughs> that was pretty much, I was right smack dab in the mayhem as a nurse. I, I liked the mayhem. I, I liked to take the seedy parts of town and the parts that were thought to be rough and um, and run down. I, I liked that the best. I, I was so uncomfortable in, you know, expensive mansions and stuff. It's like, that's just not me. <laughs> Everybody's pretending here. <laughs> Let's get down to what's real. <laughs> so that sort of, you know, this weird blend that I had the whole time. And it was so hard to reconcile. Because, you know, what is a being of love and light who just totally can hear God through a clover leaf doing in a seedy bar? What the... F what? <laughs> Enemy mine. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Love your enemy. Enemy mine. With every reveal through these, um, these videotapes I've been watching through my studies, through my research. Research I, I, I wouldn't be able to do any other way and I'm so grateful for, for YouTube. I'm so grateful. What a miracle. What a, what a wonderful thing. They, they're just, you know, this is the way to cement it. Yes, this information is available in our Merkabic fields now. We, we can access all of this now. But it's so satisfying to hear a stranger talk about something that is like, uh, I don't know. I heard one, Sh Shayana Dean. about it about it took about five and a half hours to put Humpty Dumpty back together for the veil to completely burn off and for me to see finally see is what I've been up against. What strikes me the most is what the, uh, the manipulation of the solar system. <laughs> and I looked at that and I saw all of the, the you know, the, the movements and the processions and the, the complexity and the compulsivity the compulsivity and the arrogance taking something that is obviously divine 
and good for you. And saying, I can do better. And I don't care who I hurt. In fact, it's kind of fun. I like it. That is the mind of a tweaker and a sociopath. That is what we're up against. Raw stupidity and arrogance. Enemy. <laughs> it's, di it's diabolical it is super mechanical and it's dead these tweakers don't know how to design open systems because they don't have the DNA to consider it possible they're not smart enough simply put but oh my god they're tweakers and I have seen that in my life and in my work. And I've described it. There's even an essay that talks about it. And this is what I've really, this is one of my theses, is that there is a mindset that is, is it's closed, it's karmic, it's, uh, you can call it karmic, it's cyclic, it's tarry, it's sticky, and it, it is infective. <laughs> I've been describing it. I've been living it. I've been writing and speaking. And it's only today that I feel power and peace and safety. There's a lot about the plan and about uh, what's occurring that I uh, am in agreement with and in accord with, and um, it is um, counter what we have been led to believe or understand, um, but it is coherent and consistent with everything else that I've learned and my research. I really had to struggle with that, especially overnight. I, I um, I asked for some help. Uh, the truth is that had I had this information any sooner, I, I would have, um, I would have left. I would have exited. I, I wouldn't have been able to uh, maintain enthusiasm. I barely did with, <laughs> with a complete cloak <laughs> around my head. I barely survived. Had I known what I know now, um, that would have been that. So what the teachers told me uh, way back when is really true because I wanted to know where I was from and what it's all about. <laughs> and they said that they wouldn't reveal. And that's my policy too with any with my clients. I, I, that is a, that's the most profound discussion you'll ever have with your soul. And it's not for me to tell you. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta um, ask a few questions. And you might be put on a scavenger hunt or two. And it it may, it may be a weird experience. It may be something that just is um, handed to you on a note. Who knows? But um, I'm not the one to hand you that note. And um, they told me it's because I, I, if I knew, I wouldn't stay. And now I understand why. So um, that was uh, that was the God's honest truth. And to hold this awareness um, has led to such profound peace. It's indelible. There, I, 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 all that I've been saying about there's nothing to worry about and everybody loves you and everything's cool, um, all the messages of spiritual awakening and all that, that singing from my bones and my blood and my nervous system today. So where is this enemy of mine? Still here. Still, still here.
within me. It, it took Deshana saying a joke to, to break the fear for me. She was, uh, the way that she talks about the Drax and, you know, the reptilians and all that stuff and all that, you know, all the grays and all the, she's had her tussles, okay? She's been hurt, just like we all have. But you know how she responds? She says, yeah, well, it takes a village. You got to get to the place where you love. And the only thing that energy requires of you is hate. It's the only it's the only thing that makes sense when you're when you're looking right at it. Hate and fear. That's all it knows. <laughs> well that and tweaking. Oh God. Unbelievable. So I'm sitting in my bed this morning, I'm thinking Um No wonder I've had problems with reflectivity. I am that which I hate. I contain that which I abhor. I, I am genetically, biologically part of my enemy. But you know what? Somehow, Somehow. I can see bigger than my enemy. I can do things my enemy can't. I can love them. And they don't seem capable of it. But I don't care. I love them. enemy mind. That's what shadow work is, you know? You get beat up by the shadow or you beat up somebody else and then you feel the shadow overtake you. If you do your shadow work right, it blossoms into radiant, brilliant, diamond light and love. That's the idea, always. That's the purpose. So the question becomes, how much conflict do you need to get to that love? Do you really need conflict to feel forgiveness and release? How important is it, is it to you? How necessary a device? Yeah, makeup sex is, I guess, kind of fun. I, I've never had it. I think it's retarded. Pardon, pardon the expression. It's 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 um, disordered thinking. Coming together again after misunderstandings, well, that's different. But what I'm getting here is that um, I've, I've I've witnessed couples get into cycles where um, their anger becomes their passion because they've lost their love, <laughs> and. And then they don't understand why they're in this cyclone of despair all the time. It's like, well, um, you're addicted to something that's not very healthy. <laughs> I think that's what a lot of us do. We get hooked on the conflict because we don't, we're trying, still trying to figure out what love is. Because we're trying to get it, get it from someone else. And it's just disordered thinking, that's all. It's okay. It's okay. When the lights come on, you have to make a decision. You can, you can get your juice from anger and slight and pain and disappointment, um, or you can lift anger and, uh, and you find that, um, The wind takes you, and the sea supports you, and you're no longer alone. It's very odd. 
So I'm a poet and a philosopher. I'm not not necessarily one of those who had experiences, you know, like I had my experiences in other ways and more shamanic, I guess, or visionary or la, 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 la. But I did it all in amnesia. <laughs> and finally, the big reveal, boop. <laughs> oh, my God. We're <laughs> up against tweakers. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> they're so, they're, they're like, they're, they're impaired. They're impaired. They're dangerous, but they're, they're not healthy people. And they're not, it's not a healthy consciousness. It's going to do unhealthy things. Okay. Well. It isn't a conundrum. It isn't a puzzle. It isn't a problem. It's the task at hand. Figuring out exactly what or who or if. There's an enemy. It really took realizing that by virtue of being human, I, I am, I have internalized through my genetic code this whole setup. And um, because this darkness, or whatever you want to call it, has individuated and tapped me on the shoulder and um, messed with me, um, it became a priority for me to figure out exactly what it was. So I'll end by telling you about my aha. Because <coughs> it's really been hard for me to, to know, am I good or am I bad? Because I freaking resonate with the dark. I understand the dark. I don't mind it. I'm kind of immune. It doesn't seem to stain me, but instead invigorate me. And it makes me appear dark and corrupted to some. Enemy mind. I am that which I fear. I am my own destroyer. I am paradox. I am a singularity. And I am the creative essence. I know and am with that thing that if you've been touched by it, if you've run after it and touched it, you know what I'm talking about. The isness, the all, God, creator, source, the unified field. Call it what you will. It doesn't mind. I resonate with the dark because I created the dark. Because I like a good story. And because with free will the way it is. Well, there was a part of me that wanted to run free and defy and say you can't make me huh interesting will is a quantum force love is a quantum force my enemy. 
likes to play with will and ignore the solvent that is love. And I am my enemy. And I am at peace with what was, what is, and what is to come. I love my enemy. I love myself. And I love you. I declare this a day when all misunderstandings fall. All misdeeds is, is see, are seen as our own. Seen for the silliness they are and dismissed with a chortle. I know my enemy and I know why I can go dark. I know why it's bothered me when I have gone dark. But there is no enemy. It's just a game. And the light always wins. Always, without exception. That's the only rule. This has been a wonderful, wonderful game. Big to little, little to big. Love your enemy. Enemy mine. Selah.